In the world of cryptozoology, two mythical beasts stand head and shoulders above the rest. You've no doubt heard their names, seen the evidence, and wondered to yourself, hmm, could such fantastical beasts exist? Well, let's just say that they do. We've lined up the facts and are ready to embark on a journey into the worlds of Bigfoot and Yetis. Bigfoot is, without question, the rock star of all North American folklore. This wondrous beast, which is sometimes referred to as Sasquatch, is said to be hairy, upright walking, ape-like humanoids who dwell in the wilderness and leave behind massive footprints, hence their name. Researchers often portray Bigfoot as a missing link between humans and human ancestors or other great apes. They are said to live mainly in the Pacific Northwest, particularly in Oregon, Washington and British Columbia, but people have claimed to have seen the mythical legend all across North America. Over the years, these creatures have been the inspiration for numerous commercial ventures and yes, of course, hoaxes. What's the term for when more than one of these creatures is spotted? They're sometimes referred to as either Bigfoots or Big Feet. Folklorists have traced the origins of Bigfoot to a combination of factors and sources. These include folklore surrounding the European wild man figure, folk belief amongst Native Americans and loggers, and a cultural increase in environmental concerns. Witnesses who have claimed to have seen Bigfoot say it's a large, muscular, bipedal, ape-like creature who stands roughly at about six to nine feet in height and is covered in hair that has been described as dark brown, dark reddish or black. The gigantic footprints from which the creatures are named after are said to be as large as 24 inches in length and about eight inches wide. It should be noted that some footprint casts have had distinct claw marks. This makes it likely that they came from known animals such as bears, which also have five toes and claws. The majority of mainstream scientists have long discounted Bigfoot's existence. Considering it to be a combination of misidentification, folklore and hoax, instead of a living, breathing animal. According to noted anthropologist David Daigling, the legends of this giant hairy humanoid predate the name Bigfoot. They also vary in their details both between families in the same community and regionally. Ecologist Robert Pyle says that many cultures have tales of human-like giants in their folk history. He believes that people have long expressed a need to believe in some larger-than-life creature. Each and every language had its own name for the creatures featured in the local versions of such legends. Most of the time, many of the beast's descriptive names meant something sort of like wild man or hairy man. However, other names described everyday actions that it was said to perform, such as eating clams or even shaking trees. Chief Michel of the Unlacapamax tribe at Lytton, British Columbia, told such a story to folklorist Charles Hill Trout back in 1898. He named the creature by a Cilician variant, meaning the benign-faced one. Members of the Lummi tribe share stories about Semiquess, their local version of Bigfoot. The tales are similar to each other in the general descriptions of Semiquess, but details vary among various family accounts concerning the creature's activities. Some regional versions describe them as more threatening creatures. The Kui Kui or the Stiyaha were a nocturnal race. Children were warned against saying the names because if the monsters hear their names, they will come to carry off the person who called to them. Sometimes they are killed. In 1847, the Irish-born Canadian painter Paul Kane reported tales by the Indians about a race of cannibalistic wild men living on the peak of Mount St. Helens in southern Washington state named Skookums. Less menacing versions have also been reported. 
During the year 1840, Protestant missionary Elkanah Walker recorded stories of giants among the Indians living near Spokane, Washington. According to the Indians, these giants lived on and around the peaks of nearby mountains and stole salmon from the fishermen's nets when they were hungry. Back in the 20s, Indian agent J.W. Burns collected local legends and published them in a series of Canadian newspaper articles. They were stories told to him by the Stiles people of Chihalis and others. The Stiles and other regional tribes always believed that the Sasquatch was real and never wavered in this opinion. They were even offended by people who would go on to tell them that the figures were fictitious. According to Stiles' accounts, the Sasquatch would avoid white men and spoke the Lillooet language of the people at Port Douglas, British Columbia at the head of Harrison Lake. These stories were published again decades later in 1940. Burns borrowed the term Sasquatch from the Halkamelon Saskets and used it in his article to describe a hypothetical single type of creature portrayed in the local stories. Michael Rugg of the Bigfoot Discovery Museum offered a comparison between human, Gigantopithecus and Meganthropus skulls in episodes 131 and 132 of the Bigfoot Discovery Museum show. Rugg favorably compares a modern tooth, suspected of coming from a Bigfoot, to the Meganthropus fossil teeth, noting the worn enamel on the occlusal surface. The Meganthropus fossils originated from Asia, but the tooth was found near Santa Cruz, California. Bigfoot enthusiasts Grover Krantz and Jeffrey H. Bourne also believe that Bigfoot could be a primitive population of Gigantopithecus. All Gigantopithecus fossils were found in Asia. However, according to Bourne, many kinds of animals migrated across the Bering Land Bridge. He suggests that Gigantopithecus might have done so too. Gigantopithecus fossils haven't been found in the Americas. The only rediscovered fossils are of teeth and mandibles, leaving uncertainty about Gigantopithecus's travels. Krantz has contended that Gigantopithecus blacki could have been bipedal, based on his extrapolation of its mandible shape. Unfortunately, the relevant part of the mandible to prove this theory has never been present in any fossils. Another viewpoint is that Gigantopithecus was quadrupedal because its enormous size would have made it difficult for it to adopt a fully bipedal stride. Anthropologist Matt Cartmill takes issue with a Gigantopithecus hypothesis by saying, The trouble with this account is that Gigantopithecus was not a hominin and may be not even a crown group hominoid. Yet the physical evidence implies that Bigfoot is an upright biped with buttocks and a long, stout, permanently adducted hallux. These are hominin autopomorphies, not found in other mammals or other bipeds. It seems unlikely that Gigantopithecus would have evolved these unique hominin traits in parallel. Despite all of these identity-related conflicts, there are those who want to see the Bigfoot or Sasquatch get an actual scientific classification. In 2013, ZooBank, the non-governmental organization that is generally accepted by zoologists to assign species names, approved the registration request for the species named Homo sapiens cognatus to be used for the reputed hominid more familiarly known as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Were they stolen? Maybe that's why no one's ever found their remains. They just disappeared. Just what happened to Bigfoot, if anything at all, is the cause for much debate. Whilst such discussion continues to rage, let's switch our attention to another famous cryptid. In Himalayan folklore, the Yeti is a horrific creature. Western pop culture would later come to refer to this mythical monster as the Abominable Snowman. The names Yeti and Meite are typically used by people who live in specific regions where the creature is a part of their folk beliefs. Tales of the Yeti first emerged as a facet of Western popular culture during the 19th century. Like Bigfoot, scientists have generally thought of the Yeti as being the result of a complex of intricate folk beliefs instead of a large ape-like creature. The word Yeti comes from the Tibetan word Ya, which means rocky or rocky place, and either Tai, Ti or Te comes from the spoken word Tre, which is Tibetan for bear. 
The R in tree or tray is pronounced softly, making it sound more like T or T. Other names used by Himalayan peoples don't translate exactly the same way, but they do refer to indigenous and even legendary wildlife. Micha translates as man bear, Zute, Zu translates as cattle, and the full meaning translates as cattle bear, referring to the Himalayan brown bear. Migoi or Maigo translates as wild man. Bun Manchi is Nepali for jungle man and is used outside Sherpa communities where Yeti is the common name. Merka is another name for wild man. Local legend holds that anyone who sees one dies or is killed. The latter is taken from a written statement by Frank Smythe Sherpas in 1937. Kang Admi means snowman. Zhueren is Chinese for snowman. And finally, the Abominable Snowman. The name Abominable Snowman was created in 1921, the same year that Lieutenant Colonel Charles Howard Berry led the British Mount Everest Reconnaissance Expedition. Howard Berry chronicled the trek in his book, Mount Everest, The Reconnaissance. In the 1921 book, Howard Berry includes a story about crossing the Lac Pilar at 21,000 feet. During the crossing, he found footprints that he believed were probably caused by a large loping grey wolf, which in the soft snow formed double tracks, rather like those of a barefooted man. He adds that to his Sherpa guides. Howard Berry believes that the footprints must belong to the legendary wild man of the snows, who was known to locals as Mito Kangmi. Mito translates to man bear, and Kangmi translates to snowman. The use of the term abominable snowman started when a long-time contributor to the statesman in Calcutta, Henry Newman, writing under the pen name Kim, interviewed the baggage bearers of the Everest Reconnaissance Expedition upon their return to Darjeeling. Newman mistranslated the word Mito as filthy and substituted the term abominable in its place. Some believe this was done as an artistic license, but it stuck. In the year 1832, James Princeps' Journal of the Asiatic Society of Bengal published an account of trekker B. H. Hodgson's experiences in northern Nepal. Hodgson's local guides spotted a tall bipedal creature covered with long dark hair which seemed to run away in fear. Hodgson later concluded that it might have been an orangutan. An early record of supposed Yeti footprints appeared in Lawrence Waddell's 1899 book, Among the Himalayas. Waddell said his guides described a sizable ape-like creature who left the prints. Waddell thought the prints were made by a bear. Waddell heard many tales of bipedal ape-like creatures, but wrote that none, however, of the many Tibetans I have interrogated on this subject could ever give me an authentic case. On the most superficial investigation, it always resolved into something that somebody heard tell of. The frequency of Yeti reports rose significantly during the early 20th century, when Westerners began making attempts to scale the many mountains in the area. Occasionally, these adventurers reported finding strange tracks and seeing odd creatures. In the year 1925, a photographer and member of the Royal Geographical Society named N. A. Tombazi wrote that he saw a creature at the height of about 15,000 feet near Zemu Glacier. Tombazi later wrote that he watched the creature for about a minute from about 108 to 270 miles away. Tombazi said, unquestionably, the figure in outline was exactly like a human being, walking upright and occasionally stopping to pull at some dwarf rhododendron bushes. It showed up dark against the snow and, as far as I could make out, wore no clothes. About two hours later, Tombazi and his companions climbed down the mountain and saw the creature's prints, which were described as similar in shape to those of a man, but only six to seven inches long by four inches wide. The prints were undoubtedly those of a biped. Western interest in the Yeti grew significantly in the 50s. Whilst trying to climb Mount Everest in 1951, Eric Shipton took photographs of several large prints in the snow at about 20,000 feet above sea level. These photos have been subject to intense debate and scrutiny. Some insist that they are the best evidence of Yeti's existence, and others argue that the prints are just those of a mundane creature that was distorted by the melting snow. 
Bigfoot researcher Peter Byrne reported finding a Yeti footprint in 1948 in northern Sikkim, India, near the Zemu Glacier, whilst on holiday from a Royal Air Force assignment in India. In the year 1953, Tenzing Norgay and Sir Edmund Hillary reported seeing large footprints whilst climbing Mount Everest. Hillary would later say that the Yeti reports were unreliable. In his first autobiography, Tenzing said that he believed the Yeti was a gigantic ape, and even though he had never seen it himself, his father did see one twice. In his second autobiography, he said he has become far more skeptical about the Yeti's existence. The request came from Dr. Melba S. Ketchum, a doctor of veterinary medicine and lead scientist of the Sasquatch Genome Project, following the publication of novel North American hominins, next generation sequencing of three whole genomes and associated studies. Ketchum made his request via an article that appeared in the February 2013 issue of the De Novo Journal of Science. The report examined 111 samples of blood, tissue, hair and other specimens characterized and hypothesized to have been obtained from elusive hominins in North America, commonly referred to as Sasquatch. Zoobank is an adjunct to the ICZN, the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature. The Sasquatch Genome Project is a collaboration of an interdisciplinary team of scientists from independent public and academic laboratories. This is only the first official step in scientific recognition of the species. A follow-up step would be to secure the attention and inclusion of a DNA sample from Homo sapiens cognatus by GemBank, a DNA repository whose catalogue, though incomplete, is well recognised by the scientific community. GenBank provides standardised accepted procedures for the analysis and collection of DNA samples. According to a statement by an ICZN associate scientist, to the rules. The evidence supporting the existence of such a large ape-like creature has often been attributed to delusions or hoaxes instead of sightings of a genuine beast. In a 1996 USA Today article, Washington State zoologist John Crane said, There is no such thing as Bigfoot. No data other than material that's been fabricated has ever been presented. Also, scientists cite the fact that Bigfoot is alleged to live in regions unusual for a large non-human primate, including temperate latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere. All recognized apes are found in the tropics of Africa and Asia. However, famed primatologist Jane Goodall told National Public Radio, well, now you will be amazed when I tell you that I'm sure that they exist. Dmitry Bayanov, chairman of the Smolin Seminar on Questions of Hominology at the Darwin Museum, Moscow, Russia, stated, All researchers versed in this science know that Bigfoot is a mammal, not a myth, because of the female's conspicuous mammae. All know that Bigfoot is a primate because of its soul's dermal ridges, a diagnostic characteristic of primates. All hominologists, respectful of logic and the current classification of primates, know that Bigfoot is a non-sapiens hominid because of its non-human way of life and bipedalism. I think that one of the great scientific results of the 20th century was the discovery of relict hominids, or homins for short, popularly known as abominable snowman, yeti, yeren, almas, almasti, Bigfoot, sasquatch, etc.
It was a rediscovery by hominologists of what had been known to Western naturalists from antiquity to the middle of the 18th century when Carl Linnaeus classified wild bipedal primates as cavemen, homo troglodytes, or homo sylvestris, which is the scientific term for woodman or forest man. As for Eastern scholars and rural population in many parts of the world, they have always been aware of wild, hairy bipeds known under several popular names. Despite the weight of the words of many notable scholars in the field of animal study, many other mainstream scientists don't consider the subject of Bigfoot to be a tangible area for credible science. There have been a limited number of formal scientific studies of Bigfoot. Evidence, such as the 1967 Patterson-Gimlin film, has provided no supportive data of any scientific value. Great apes haven't been located in the Americas fossil record, and no one has ever uncovered or identified any Bigfoot remains. Phillips Stevens, a cultural anthropologist at the University at Buffalo, summarized the scientific consensus as follows. It defies all logic that there is a population of these things sufficient to keep them going. What it takes to maintain any species, especially a long-lived species, is you must have a breeding population. That requires a substantial number spread out over a fairly wide area where they can find sufficient food and shelter to keep hidden from all the investigators. We may not know any exact numbers or have any foolproof methods of describing Sasquatch, but there is an abundance of fools out there who love to try. Let the hoaxing begin. There's so much false information that both Bigfoot believers and non-believers alike agree that many of the reported sightings are hoaxes or only misidentified animals. Author Jerome Clark contends that the Jacko affair was a hoax involving an 1884 newspaper report of an ape-like creature captured in British Columbia. He mentions research by John Green, who found that several British Columbia newspapers regarded the alleged capture as highly suspicious, and notes that the mainland guardian of New Westminster, British Columbia, wrote absurdity is written on the face of it. Tom Biscardi is a long-time Bigfoot enthusiast and chief executive officer of Searching for Bigfoot, Inc. During his life and career, he has appeared on the Coast to Coast AM Paranormal Radio Show many times. On July the 14th, 2005, Biscardi said that he was 98% sure that his group will be able to capture a Bigfoot which they had been tracking in the Happy Camp, California area. A month later, he announced on the same radio show that he had access to a captured Bigfoot and was arranging a pay-per-view event for people to see it. He appeared on Coast to Coast AM again a few days later to announce that there was no captive Bigfoot. He blamed an unnamed woman for misleading him and said that the show's audience was gullible. On July the 9th, 2008, Rick Dyer and Matthew Witten posted a video to YouTube claiming that they had discovered the body of a dead Sasquatch in the northern Georgia forest. Tom Biscardi was contacted to investigate. Dyer and Witten received $50,000 from Searching for Bigfoot Inc. as a good faith gesture. The story was covered by many major news networks and was treated with a great deal of credibility by outlets such as ABC News, Fox News, CNN and the BBC. Following a press conference, the alleged Bigfoot body was delivered in a freezer that was home to a block of ice with the Searching for Bigfoot team. When the suspected remains were thawed out, observers found that the head was hollow, the hair wasn't real and the feet were made of rubber. Dyer and Witten admitted that it was a hoax after being confronted by Steve Culls, executive director of SquatchDetective.com. Sometimes these hoaxes even turn tragic. Such is the case when, in August 2012, a man in Montana wearing a ghillie suit was killed by a car whilst pretending to be Bigfoot. 
Rick Dyer, the perpetrator of a previous Bigfoot hoax, wasn't finished with the legend yet. In January 2014, Dyer said that he had killed a Bigfoot creature in September 2012 outside San Antonio, Texas. Dyer said that he had scientific tests performed on the body, from DNA tests to 3D optical scans to body scans. It is the real deal. It's Bigfoot, and Bigfoot's here, and I shot it, and now I'm proving it to the world. Dyer said that he was keeping the body in a hidden location, and he intended to take it on a tour across North America in 2014. He released photos of the body and a video showing a few individuals' reactions to seeing it, but never released any of the tests or scans. Dyer flat out refused to disclose the test results or to provide biological samples. He said that the DNA results were done by an undisclosed lab and couldn't be matched to any known animal. According to Dyer, he would reveal the body and tests on February the 9th, 2014, at a news conference at Washington University, but he never made the test results available. After the Phoenix tour, the Bigfoot body was taken to Houston. On March the 28th, 2014, Dyer admitted on his Facebook page that his Bigfoot corpse was another hoax. He had paid Chris Russell of Twisted Toy Box to manufacture the prop, which he named Hank, from latex, foam, and camel hair. Dyer earned approximately $6,000 from the tour of this second fake Bigfoot corpse. He said that he did kill a Bigfoot, but did not take the real body on the road for fear that it would be stolen. During the Daily Mail Snowman Exhibition of 1954, the mountaineering leader John Angelo Jackson made the first journey from Everest to Kanchenjunga. During this trek, he photographed symbolic paintings of the Yeti at Tengbosh Gompa in eastern Nepal. Jackson tracked and shot a lot of footprints in the snow, most of which were easily identifiable. However, there were many large footprints that weren't identifiable. These flattened footprint-like indentations were thought to be the erosion and subsequent widening of the original print by particles and wind. On March the 19th, 1954, the Daily Mail printed an article that made mention of expedition teams getting hair specimens from what was believed to be a Yeti scalp found in the Pangbosh Monastery. The hairs appeared to be dark brown to black when viewed in dim light, and fox red in the sunlight. The hair was examined by Professor Frederick Wood Jones, an expert in human and comparative anatomy. During the examination, the specimens were cut into sections, bleached and examined microscopically. The research consisted of taking micro photographs of the hairs and comparing them with strands from known animals like orangutans and bears. Jones concluded that the hairs weren't actually from a scalp. He maintained that whilst some animals do have a ridge of hair extending from the pate to the back, no animals have a ridge running from the base of the forehead across the pate and ending at the nape of the neck. Jones wasn't able to pinpoint precisely the animal from which the Pangbosh hairs were taken. However, he was convinced that the hairs didn't come from an anthropoid ape or a bear. Jones suggested that the hairs were from the shoulder of a coarse-haired, hooved animal. Slavomir Ravitch claimed in his 1956 book, The Long Walk, that as he and some others were crossing the Himalayas during the winter of 1940, their path was blocked for several hours by two bipedal animals that were doing nothing but shuffling around in the snow. Hey, even a yeti has to make time to play, right? Beginning in 1957, millionaire Tom Slick funded several missions to investigate yeti reports. In 1959, supposed Yeti feces was collected by one of Slick's expeditions. The fecal analysis found a parasite that couldn't be classified. This fueled belief in the creature. 
a belief so strong that even the United States government thought that finding the Yeti was likely enough to create three rules for American expeditions searching for it. The rules are as follows. Obtain a Nepalese permit. Do no harm to the Yeti except in self-defense. Let the Nepalese government approve any news reporting on the animal's discovery. In the year 1960, Sir Edmund Hillary mounted the 1960-1961 Silverhut expedition to the Himalayas. The purpose of the journey was to collect and examine any physical evidence of the Yeti. Hillary borrowed a supposed Yeti scalp from the Kumjung Monastery, then himself and the village headman, Kumjo Chumbi, brought the scalp back to London where a small sample was removed for testing. Scientist Marker Burns conducted a detailed examination of hair and skin samples from the margin of the alleged Yeti scalp. Once removed, it was compared with similar samples from the black bear, the blue bear, and a medium-sized goat-like or antelope-like mammal known as the cerro. Burns concluded that the sample was probably made from the skin of an animal, closely resembling the sampled specimen of cerro, but not identical with it, possibly a local variety or race of the same species, or a different but closely related species. Until the 60s, belief in the Yeti was relatively common in a country in South Asia known as Bhutan. In 1966, a Bhutanese stamp was made to honour the creature. However, in the 21st century, belief in the being has declined rapidly. In 1970, a British mountaineer named Don Willans claimed to have seen a creature whilst scaling Annapurna Himalayas in north-central Nepal. According to Willens, he once saw the creature moving on all fours. In 1983, Himalayan natural historian Robert L. Fleming Jr. and Himalayan conservationist Daniel C. Taylor led a Yeti expedition into Nepal's barren valley. The Taylor-Fleming team discovered intriguing large nests in trees, similar Yeti-like footprints, and vivid reports from local villagers of two bears. Further interviews across Nepal provided evidence of a local belief in two massive and different bears. The team collected skulls, and they were compared to known skulls at the British Museum, the Smithsonian Institution, and the American Museum of Natural History. The skull confirmed the identification of a single species, the Asiatic black bear. In 2004, editor of the journal Nature, Henry G, mentioned the Yeti as an example of folk belief deserving further study. According to G, the discovery that Homo floresiensis survived until so very recently, in geological terms, makes it more likely that stories of other mythical human-like creatures such as Yetis are founded on grains of truth. In early December 2007, American television presenter Josh Gates and his team on the show, Destination Truth, reported finding a series of footprints in the Everest region of Nepal. These prints were said to resemble that of a yeti. Each of the footprints measured 13 inches in length with five toes. The tracks measured a total of 9.8 inches across. Casts of the prints were made for further examination. The footprints were analysed by Idaho State University's Jeffrey Meldrum, who believed them to be too morphologically accurate to be fake or human-made. After making further investigations of the tracks, he changed his mind. Later in 2009, Gates presented hair samples with a forensic analyst who concluded that the hair contained an unknown DNA sequence. On July the 25th, 2008, the BBC reported that hairs collected in the remote Garrow Hills area of northeast India by passionate Yeti enthusiast Dipu Marak were analysed at Oxford Brookes University in the United Kingdom. The study was performed by microscopy expert John Wells alongside primatologist Anna Nakaris. Early tests were inconclusive. 
According to ape conservation expert Ian Redmond, in an interview with the BBC, he said that there was a similarity between the cuticle pattern of these hairs and the specimens that were collected by Edmund Hillary during Himalayan expeditions in the 1950s. Redmond performed an examination that revealed that the hair came from a mammal of the cattle family called the Himalayan goral. At a 2011 conference in Russia, Yeti enthusiasts and scientists declared having 95% evidence of the Yeti's existence. American anatomist and anthropologist Jeffrey Meldrum, who was present during a recent Russian expedition, claimed that the evidence found was just an attempt by local officials to drum up publicity. A Yeti was reportedly captured in Russia during December 20. its living quadrupedal relative, the orangutan. In 2013, scientists from the universities of Oxford and Lausanne put out a call for people who claimed to have samples from these creatures. A mitochondrial DNA analysis of the 12S RNA gene was performed on hair samples from an unidentified creature from the northern India region of Ladakh, west of the Himalayas, and unidentified hair samples from Bhutan. These samples were then analysed alongside those housed in the International Repository of Gene Sequences, GenBank. They matched a sample from an ancient polar bear jawbone found in Svalbard, Norway, dating back to between 40,000 to 120,000 years ago.
The result suggests that excluding the possibilities of planted samples, contaminated materials or flat-out hoaxes, bears who lived in these regions may have been mistaken for or misidentified as being yetis. Bill Amos, professor of evolutionary genetics at the University of Cambridge, doubted the samples were of polar bears in the Himalayas, but was 90% convinced that there is a bear in these regions that have been mistaken for a yeti. When all is said and done, it is believed that DNA holds the key to the accurate identification of Bigfoot or the Yeti. Professor Brian Sykes, whose team analysed the samples at Oxford University, has a different theory. Sykes believes that it's more likely that the samples came from a hybrid species of bear, possibly the result of a mating between a polar bear and a brown bear. In 2015, research of 12SRNA revealed that many of the unidentified collected hair samples came from brown bears. In 2017, a new analysis compared DNA sequences of bears from the region with DNA extracted from hair and other samples claimed to have come from a yeti. The study included hair thought to be from the same preserved specimen as the anomalous Sykes sample. It showed that the sample came from a Himalayan brown bear. Other alleged Yeti samples turned out to have come from the Asiatic black bear, the Tibetan blue bear, and even a domestic dog. In 2017, an American scholar and practitioner of social change with notable achievements in community-led conservation and global education named Daniel C. Taylor published a comprehensive analysis of the century-long Yeti literature. In his study, Taylor added evidence to the explanation building on the initial Barron Valley discoveries. Importantly, this book under the Oxford University imprint gave a meticulous explanation for the iconic Yeti footprint photographed by Eric Shipton in 1950, also the 1972 Cronin McNeely print, as well as all other unexplained Yeti footprints. To complete this explanation, Taylor also located a never-before-published photograph in the archives of the Royal Geographical Society, taken in 1950 by Eric Shipton, that included scratches that are bare nail marks. Given the vast amount of in-depth research, the photos, and DNA tests that have been performed, it's hard to believe that evidence of this creature's existence remains inconclusive. It is difficult for scientists to produce conclusive proof of either Bigfoot or the Yeti's existence. We may never get the answer that humankind has been searching for, and every time we do get an answer, it inevitably leads to more questions. So many questions. Everyone asks, if these creatures did exist, how come no one has ever located their remains? If they were intelligent social creatures, wouldn't there be burial grounds in the vein of an elephant's graveyard? Now here's an out there bit of speculation for you to chew on. Maybe the reason no one has found the remains of Yetis or the Bigfoot is that they're the spirits of long dead missing links wandering the earth, making noises, and leaving behind residual evidence like footprints. Or maybe, just maybe, these things do not want to be found. Either way, the legends of Bigfoot and the Yeti will continue to grow and fascinate the masses. The lack of proof regarding their existence has only served to add to their mystery.